Uh, hi, and welcome to Talk Word. I'm Marty Dundix, Editor-in-Chief of Weekly Humorous Magazine, and this is Talk Word, a fun little podcast where professionally funny people come to tell awkward and cringeworthy stories. Uh, today, I have a comedy legend in the office today. Uh, I've known him for years in many different iterations of many different comedy uh, uh, projects, and everybody in the world knows uh, this particular comedy person, and every major comedian knows this particular comedy person, and I'm very happy to welcome Jeffrey Gurian to the podcast. Hey, Thanks. Jeffrey. Hey, Mark. How are you doing? How are you doing? It's so great to be here with you. I love this. Um, this is fun. This is exciting. I mean, you always have something interesting going on. Well, I hope you know, so. I you, never, you never rest on your laurels. I, I, I'm having my laurels reupholstered, actually, oh because I've worn them out. <laughs> What's the pattern on the laurels going to be? Like a leopard print? And it's really hard to find people who can work on laurels, you know, these uh, days anyway. Those are some mighty laurels you got they there. They certainly are. Hello. <laughs> um, you're an author on top of being a doctor, a comedian, um, a healer. I got a, too many hyphens in my A name. happiness maker. <laughs> you have a new book out called Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind, a spiritual and humorous approach to achieving happiness by Dr. Jeffrey Elgurian. And the cover of this book, I think, is very fun because it is a dog achieving nirvana. A dog in lotus position. Yeah. You know how hard it is to get a dog to sit like that in lotus position? It's a well-trained dog. <laughs> yeah, a very well-trained dog. You know, I, when, when I was putting the cover together, I wanted to get images that would draw people's attention. And people love dogs, and dog is God spelled backwards. I don't know if you realize that. I did not ever yeah. think of that. And, huh. it's, and, and it's a very mystical kind of an image. So it's a, it's a dog floating on an orange pillow, orange being the color of the second chakra, okay. which is the chakra of creativity and sensitivity and all good things. And then there's like a, a mandala or a mandala, a mandala in the background, in, in this, like in a like a, a scene of clouds. It was just, I wanted to create something mystical that would draw people's attention. And it seems to be working. People are resonating with the book. It's my other life, you know? That's why it's written as doctor. I don't usually use that. You don't use the doctor? But when it's about thought, it's about psychology and thought. And for the last 20 years, I've been on the board of this interesting group called the Association for Spirituality and Psychotherapy. And I presented my work to them on dealing with depression and creating happiness and they accepted my work and on the back of the book i have like amazing reviews from psychiatrists and psychologists this is a nice book recovery centers thank you thanks so much and so it's been doing really well it actually it hit bestseller status on amazon and wow it's very rewarding to me what's the number uh you had to you have to hit to get a bestseller on amazon you get certain categories yeah so, so this is in the happiness yeah, it, it it hit number one in um, uh, adult children of alcoholics, uh, self-help. Uh, it was number one also in um, medicine and psychology. They have many Richard different Lewis. categories. Yeah, I, I love, love Richard, Richard Lewis. Lewis. You know, I once sent jokes to Richard Lewis because we've been friends for a long time, and he's never done anybody's jokes. But I have a recording that he left me, and he said if he was going to do anybody's jokes, they would be mine. And he, it was such a nice interview that I kept it on my phone. Not interview, a nice uh, phone message that I kept it on my phone all these years. And I told him if we were ever going to do a tour, it should be called the Born to be Nervous Tour. Because <laughs> if I ever had a tattoo, that's what it would say, Born to be n- Nervous, you know? Some guys have Born to be Wild. Yeah. Born to be Nervous. It'd be perfect. Um, out of, out of all the different things you teach in this book, what's the number one, um, what's the number one kind of theme to be happy? Well, first I should What can I do to be happy today? Like, what's a simple exercise to be happy? I'll explain it, and first I'll explain what the title means. When it says, healing your heart by changing your mind. From the time we're kids, every time somebody says something that hurts our feelings, they break a promise to you, they break up with you, they let you down in some way. It creates pain. I call them a heart wound. You keep that memory inside of you, in your heart chakra. Every bad... Like, you know that saying they tell you when you're a kid, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never harm you? That's the furthest from the truth. Because all the bruises you got as a kid healed up a long time ago. Right. But every single one of us can remember something that someone said to us that hurt our feelings or humiliated us or embarrassed us. 
in some way. We keep those things inside of us and they affect our self-esteem, they affect our self-confidence because on some level we tend to believe them. And very often they were, these were thoughts that were given to us by people who did not have our best interests at heart. Sometimes it was our parents or people in our family, but other times it was strangers on the street that made a remark to you or bullies that picked on you as a kid. And those things stay with us. And they, as I said, they affect your self-esteem and self-confidence. Mm-hmm. But most importantly, they affect every decision you make in your life. Because every time you're called upon to make a decision, you think about what you should do. You use your thoughts. Because who else's thoughts can you use, right? Mm-hmm. So you think about what you should do. But if some of your thoughts are not valid, which uh, pertains to many of us, and I'll tell you how it pertained to me in particular, but... If you're using thoughts that are not valid, your decisions are not going to work for you, which is why we see patterns in our life of things that continually don't work out for us. We th- we're, we're drawn to date the wrong people. We take jobs that are not fulfilling for us. Uh, we keep making friends of people who stab us in the back. There are certain patterns, and it's because our thinking is off. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to, to observe your own thinking. It's very hard to examine your own thinking objectively because if you have any intelligence at all, you tend to believe your thoughts, right? Yeah. But every thought you have, you created. A thought is just energy. You create your thoughts, and interestingly enough, they're not based on your experience. They're based on your interpretation of your experience, which I find very interesting. So it's like two kids. You can have siblings that grow up in the same household that come, come out completely different people. And if you ask them to tell about their childhoods with the same parents, they could have completely different stories because it's their interpretation of what happened to them. Mm -hmm. So most of us are more sensitive than we give ourselves credit for. We tend to be very sensitive and we tend to block our sensitivity, especially men. We don't like to cop to being sensitive. Men are taught not to be sensitive. Don't feel your feelings. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which can work against us as well. Women who are gifted with a sensitivity that often feels like a burden instead of a strength, uh, more patients of depression uh, are women than men. More, more people who suffer with uh, emotional illness tend to be women more than men. And it's because of that, because our society gives them the wrong message. Our society tells them that they're too sensitive when it's exactly the opposite. The more sensitive you become, the more empathetic you become to your fellow man. So the world would be a kinder place if people honored their sensitivity. So what this book is about is about looking at your past and realizing that you can't change your past. The only thing you could change is your perspective of your past. So in my particular case, I use myself as an example because I've had to overcome many obstacles in my life, and one of them was stuttering. I stuttered very badly well into my 20s and beyond, even into my 30s. Uh, I couldn't even say my name. I could never say Gurian. Uh, most stutterers have a hard time saying their names. Mm-hmm. And my reason I was for also that, a stutterer. Were you really? I, I spent a very long time in speech therapy. That is amazing yeah. to me. To well, overcome that kind of like speech therapy is really tough because it feels like you're trapped. Well, when I your... went to speech therapy, they started me in elementary school. That's so interesting to me, Marty. I never. I was knew also. That I was in. Spe- I was in elementary school. Miss Shuba. Yeah. Which is also a well, tough name to say. It, it has a Z's and it has a U. And uh, no one in the class could say her name. It was funny because we were in, it was, uh, it was a speech therapy class. And everybody in the class, it was only five of us, we all had something different wrong with us. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't, it wasn't all stutterers. It wasn't all um, R. I was R and a stutterer. And then other people had like a kind of that. Yeah. So we all had our own thing. Everybody had their own And we were all working on it separately together. But it was interesting, but go on, I'm sorry. Well, no, no, not at all. I'm fascinated by that history. I had no idea about you, which is wonderful. because, And it's a good message to put out that you can be helped with stuttering. For me, mm. that therapy didn't work. It actually made me worse because it gave me the idea that there was something wrong with me. It acknowledged that fact. When you're surrounded by other kids with problems, you tend to think that there's something wrong with you. Well, therapy didn't work for me. And I remember very clearly when I got to college... I made myself run for the president of the freshman class, and I told myself if I could win the election, I wouldn't have to stutter anymore because I had a feeling it had, it had something to do with how I felt about myself. And I went to a very big college. It was 
fed in by seven different high schools. So I knew the people from my high school. I was kind of well-known in high school, but I was much younger than the other kids. And I think I must have had an inferiority complex that in order to help myself, I had to turn it into a superiority complex, not to feel better than other people, but just to feel even, just yeah. to feel that I could show up. So I, I made myself run for president, and I couldn't say my name, so I had to get other kids to be my campaign managers, and they'd introduce me to kids I didn't know, and they'd say, hey, this is Jeffrey Gurian, and he's running for president, and vote for this kid, and all. Long story short, I won the election. I was the president of the freshman class, and I still stuttered, and it was a great lesson for me in life in general because it taught me that outside validation doesn't work. Mm. It doesn't matter how many people compliment you, tell you that you're great and fantastic and fabulous. It really matters what you think of yourself. And at that point, I was determined to do something to help myself because I realized I didn't stutter when I was alone. I could go into a room by myself yeah. and speak perfectly. And every stutterer knows what words are hard for them to say. Hard Ds, hard Gs, uh, Ts are very often hard to say. But every stutterer, if you give him a piece of paper and say, what words are going to be hard for you, they'll be able to pick them out because mm -hmm. they know. You 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 predestine yourself to stuttering on certain words. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. I I it was interesting because it, it's it's like a mental block because it wasn't like I couldn't say it. It it would it would just be like I would get stuck for some reason. You'd get stuck. And I yeah like like the speech therapy never really helped me with the stuttering. It helped me with saying R. I couldn't say R. And um, I remember what did you used to say instead oh, of R? Like, or or it oh, just really? came it came out it wrong. Did, you came out wrong. Huh? And um, I grew up. I was born in Mystic, Connecticut. So there was a bit of an accent. And then I moved to Maryland, and then it was it wasn't ignored anymore. And but it was tough because I couldn't say my own name. I couldn't say Marty. I, I would say like Modi, Marty, Marty. And um, I remember an entire season of Little League Baseball. The kids are cruel when you do well, yeah. like that. Other I had a whole I had a whole season of Little League Baseball. My best friend uh, Frank White. Never corrected the coach of the team. He said, "What's your name, Modi?" And I said, "No, it's it's Modi, not Modi." And he's like, "Got it, Modi." <laughs> no, and I must have been—I don't know. This was like I was thirteen, maybe no, maybe like eleven. And my buddy Frank thought it was so funny, so he never corrected the coach. He called me that the entire season. Modi. And like my parents were like, "Why is he calling you that?" I'm like, "Cause I couldn't, I couldn't say my name right." And he thought that was my name, and that was so embarrassing. And it was, I just like, I hated it, and I just had to overcome it. And I noticed you could. I got myself to stop stuttering because I noticed that I never stuttered when I was performing in some way. When I was singing, mm -hmm. didn't happen. When I was on stage um, in like an actor type uh, scene type thing didn't happen like yeah. if i had and it won't lines. happen if you're talking to a child if you're talking to a baby if you're talking to a pet yeah you won't stutter so i realized you're not being if, judged yeah ahead, if i then. pre if i like pre-thought everything and paced myself i would always not stutter because it was like i it was like i was uh, i wasn't just speaking out i was i was sort of thinking about it before i said it if i thought about it before i said it i wouldn't stutter so i now it just made me slower and it made me think more about my words which is better for uh, public speaking, public speaking well, broadcasting, like everything. So it was actually, it was a great lesson that I've yes, used my entire absolutely. life. Absolutely, and I used it too. And, you know, what's amazing, I came to the conclusion, when I realized that I didn't study when I was alone, I said to myself, you know, you can't have a disability based on your location. If a man has a limp, he limps in every room of his house. He can't go into a room, close the door, and walk perfectly. Exactly. If he could, he'd stay there. But if I could go into a room and close the door and walk perfectly, then there means that theoretically there's nothing wrong with me. And I started using humor to help myself. And I started thinking things like, what if I thought there was nobody in there? What if someone was hiding in the room and I'm alone, I think I'm alone and I'm speaking perfectly and suddenly someone pops up? How quickly do I have to start stuttering? Right. Right. Can I give myself a grace period of a minute or two? Do I, must I start as soon as I, I see the person? And I started trying to make stuttering seem like a ridiculous thing to do. Like if I have something to tell you and I say, hey, Marty, I got this really important thing to tell you. And you say, what, Jeff? And I start choking myself so my voice won't come out. It makes no sense, right? Yeah. Who would do that? Right. Basically, that's what I'm doing when I'm stuttering. I'm stuttering for someone. And what's the reason I do that? Uh, as an avocation, I work with stutterers and I teach them my technique about how not to stutter. And I tell them, it's not important to ever try to figure out exactly why you stuttered. It's important to look at all the possibilities. You know, In my case, my mom was a perfectionist. 
she gave me so much attention and everything had to be just perfect. And as a child, you can't really talk back to your parents. These days they do, but in those mm. days, nobody did that. One way of getting even might be to say, you want me to be perfect? I'll show you how imperfect I can be. I won't even be able to speak properly. So I worked on myself for years and I literally took my mind apart and I examined all my thoughts and I realized that I was holding negative thoughts about myself and I had to build up my confidence in myself to allow myself to stop stuttering, to free myself from the bondage of stuttering. And I talk about that a lot in the book, but it's not only about studying, it's stuttering, it's about overcoming obstacles in your life. Mm -hmm. Each one of us gets obstacles and sometimes you have to accept them. There's, there's a, a spiritual concept. And I, I talk about spirituality, and I always try to make a distinction between spirituality and religion because one has nothing to do with the other. Religion can be wonderful for people, but it tends to divide us as a society because it puts you into a category, and other people are automatically outside that category if they're not in your religion. And what spirituality does is it brings us all together because all it asks is that you believe in a force greater than yourself. Mm -hmm. it, you could call it nature or the universe or God, whatever is comfortable for you, as long as you realize that it isn't you. Because when you think that you are running your own life, you tend to blame yourself when things don't go the way you'd like them to go. You know, mm -hmm. you think, oh, I should have said this. I could have done this. If I had only thought of this, you know. But meanwhile, what you don't realize is that everything is happening exactly the way it's supposed to. My whole life was leading up to this moment where I'm sitting here talking to you. And so, wow, I, I, that's pretty <laughs> flattering. <laughs> well, no, I'm glad but, we've been preparing for such a long time because we're staying in the now. Yeah, this is all that's happening. This is my life right now. I'm here with you. What happened this morning is gone already, and who knows about tomorrow? You don't know. So, it's important to be in present, to be in the now. Yeah, and so I try to be very present for that. And there are certain spiritual principles that are important to incorporate into your thinking that help you achieve happiness, which was your question. So, for instance, you get some disappointing news. You're working towards a project, and you really want this project to happen, and then you get news that it's not going to happen. And you think to yourself, why doesn't anything work out for me? I'm like the ultimate victim of the universe. It happens for everybody else. Mm. I see everybody else getting it. Why don't I get it? And instead of thinking of yourself as the ultimate victim of the universe where nothing works out for you, you have to think that you're not being punished. You're supposed to have something better than what you wanted, and it's not ready for you yet. What, what, what you wanted would sell yourself short, that you have to have patience, and that's hard for us as human beings. We want everything right away. Yeah. You know, we, we don't have the capacity to have patience and to think that, I'm supposed to have something better than that. So I had to train my mind to think that way. And when you can incorporate certain principles into your thinking, it tends to make your life a lot happier. It seems like there's some people, um, and it's like they attract uh, misfortune. Negativity. Now, negativity. Yeah. So it seems like certain people, oh, this is always, oh, this is always happening to me. Oh, this is falling apart. Right. And it exactly. does seem like those individuals constantly are having horrible things happen to them, and they, it's like they attract it. Yes, and that's a great point. You manifest your worst fears. You know, I don't think it's any accident that very often cancer phobes wind up getting cancer. They focus on it so much. Theoretically, what you focus your energy on, you bring into your life. So it's the power behind the power of positive thinking. Yeah. It's not just a, a cliche. Theoretically, your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between fact and fiction. So if you go through life thinking that you're a loser even subconsciously, your subconscious mind believes you. And you'll start doing... And you start drawing things you in. You start doing things that end up making that true. That confirm that yeah. for you. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you can change that, if you can flip that and tell yourself that you're a winner, which is not easy to do. These are just words. Yeah. But it takes work. You have to work on yourself. I literally worked on myself for many years. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't have the confidence to go up on stage and start performing until many years later mm -hmm. because I had already been writing for a lot of famous people and there was a lot of pressure on me. People had said, why don't you perform? And, you know, if you start performing in your 20s and nobody knows you, you have the freedom to bomb. Yeah. And that's how you get better. You go up on stage and you just keep going up until you get better and better. 
But when you're starting out from a place where people know you because you've done certain things in the comedy world, there's a lot of pressure. It's like being somebody famous's younger brother. I always yeah. feel bad for those people because there's a lot of pressure in that. And it took me many years of work on myself to have the courage to go up on stage and start performing. And I use that as an example, too. Everything is about thought. Mm-hmm. And every thought that you have affects everything in your body. There was this incredible scientist named Candace Pert, and she was one of the few women um, that had her own laboratory. I think it was in Washington, D.C. She was a scientist, and she she was an amazing woman, and I got the opportunity to meet her. Um, she wrote books about how your thoughts create chemicals in your body. Every thought you have... Um, creates certain chemicals like they say laughter creates endorphins which are the pleasure chemicals chocolate does that sex does that and it's easier to give your audience jokes than sex but um it creates chemicals that literally change the way you think so it's very important to try and stay positive you know when people are depressed they're usually caught in the past when people are depressed they're usually depressed about things that have happened to them in the past Mm-hmm. And they dwell on that, and they're 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 worried, they're they're lost in things that happen. They're fearing the future, and meanwhile they're losing the present. You know that saying? I don't know if you ever heard it. Uh, the past is a history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift, and that's why they call it the present. Ah, that's like great. That? I do like that. Yeah, I collect those sayings. They're very meaningful. And again, a lot of these things sound like cliches and they're just words, but you can take those words and have them mean something if you're willing to do the work. Each person has to work on themselves. And so what I did is I made myself a project. I've always done that to try and improve myself as a person and to try and reach certain goals in my life, you know, and Mm -hmm. I've uh, I, I you know I've been able to do a lot of things and there's so many more things that I want to do but this book has been in me for I'd say 15 to 20 years. I had a I had a very early version of it in 2001 and it was a crazy story. I was walking in the subway and there was a woman going down the stairs on crutches and I felt bad for her and I said to her, "Can I help you?" And she said, oh, that's such a nice thing that you offered that. And she let me help her down the stairs. And we got into a conversation. And she said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a writer. I said, what do you do? And she goes, I'm a book publisher. And I said, that's crazy. So I told her the idea, the early idea for this book, Mm -hmm. Heal Your Heart by Changing Your Mind. And she said, I love it. I want to do that book. And so I gave her the early thing. And she was committed to doing the book and i can't tell you what happened because i don't remember but it never happened yeah and it was disastrous for me and at the time my dad was terminally ill and he was in the hospital and i went to him and i gave him the good news that i'm having this book done and he was so happy and that could have been the reason because he made his transition shortly after that but he left knowing that i was doing this book Mm -hmm. and the book never came out about a year or so ago i got into an audience with a guy known as the Manhattan Medium, Matthew John. And he didn't know me. He didn't know I was there. And he's on a stage, and he he communicates with people who have passed on. And he told the audience, think of someone that was close to you. And so I thought about my mom, because I thought if anybody would ever reach out to me, it would be her. And all of a sudden, he says to me... "Um, does the name Ray mean anything to anyone? And I'm like, yeah, that was my dad. And they handed me a microphone, and he started, he said, and who's Margie? And I go, that was my mom. And he goes, and who's Rose? And I'm like, that was my dad's mother. Wow. And he started naming all the names of people in my family, and he started telling me all these things about my parents and things that he couldn't possibly know. Even if he knew I was there and he looked them up on the Internet, he couldn't find my great-grandmother's name. Yeah. You know? And he said to me, he said to me, I see a book for you. Is that a possibility in you? And I was just working on this book. He goes, and, and I see a book, and I see that it's going to change people's lives. And I'm like, that would be so amazing if that was the book, you know? Yeah. And it was, it, was, it was an interesting synchronicity, as Deepak Chopra would call mm-hmm. it. A very interesting synchronicity. Everything, you never meet anybody by accident. 
Right. You know, every single thing in your life, there's a reason for it. And what the reason is, you're not supposed to dwell on it. You're just supposed to be open to the concept. Sometimes it's, sometimes you meet people to teach you who you don't want in your life. Yeah. You know? Definitely. But positive thinking has always been my goal. That's my dream is to try to put positive energy out to the universe. And that's what I try to do in all the things that I do. So in my comedy, I don't talk about things that are controversial. You know, I just want to talk about silly stuff. You know, I used to write for the Weekly Humorist. Yeah, you I, are very funny. You have uh, the uh, Gurian News Network, which is uh, <laughs> news of the bazaar, I all believe. The, all the news that's fit to dance that's to. That's right. <laughs> yeah, right. And you've written <laughs> for the Weekly World News. Weekly World News, which was um, such a great honor to me. They gave me my own column. Yeah. What they said was, your stories are so strange. Excuse me, I have this candy in my mouth, which is not great for radio. They said to me, your stories are so strange, you have to have your own column. We have to put you in a separate box. So they gave me Gurian's from the aliens. The bazaar. <laughs> Our that, aliens are too mainstream for you. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what led to the book, uh, Man Rubs Bank with His Chin. Yes. Where I took many of those stories from that I was writing for the Weekly Humorist. By the way, congratulations on that. It's such Thank a great you. publication. It's been fun. It's growing fast. We got profiled in Paste Magazine recently. Really? Oh, cool. We're the top seven comedy websites you should be reading. That is awesome. It's because pretty there so many great. to be in the top seven. Yeah, that top is seven. Fantastic! Congratulations. It's very nice. Well, we've got a lot of good people. I mean, we have a lot of um, uh, a lot of old National Lampoon writers, but then a lot of current uh, weekly, uh, a lot of current uh, New Yorker and Mad Magazine and McSweeney's people. So there's like, so much talent, and there's not enough platforms. You know, like there's not enough magazines enough, anymore. Not a, yeah, exactly. So it's fun to get to be a new platform where all these people want to come and be published. So I it's really just miss like, Weekly World News, man. That was such a kick for me to be able to it's write still that. Floating and around. you know what? It was the precursor to The Onion. Yeah, it the was. The guys from The Onion told me they used to read Weekly World News, and some of them knew my stories, which was like really crazy. And you're yeah. a prolific writer. How many books have you written? Six. This is my sixth book. It's exciting. Yeah. I, you know what's crazy? I never thought I'd have even one book. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden things come to you. The what's the process book, for like writing a whole book? Like this is a this is a whole book. This is Yeah, it's a real it's this a is, real book. You know, two hundred and thirty pages of a book of yeah. a normal size, you know. And, and it's the first book that's self published. The other books were all done by established publishers. This was uh, uh Happiness Center Publications, which is me. And it's very frustrating writing books like most of my other books were all comedy. You know, I wrote yeah. the book on the comic strip, on the history of the comic strip. Chris Rock wrote the introduction to it. Mm -hmm. um, the the initial version was called Make Them Laugh, and then they did an updated version of it called Laughing Legends that that included updated versions of the stories. You know, everyone's in it. Seinfeld and Ray Romano and Colin Quinn and even Billy Crystal, who was the first comedian on stage at the comic strip when it opened in 1976. I did not know that. Um, yeah, yeah. He, he, he had been working at Catch a Rising Star and mm. came over to do this special opening because Rick Newman, who opened Catch, got friendly with Richie Tinkin, who opened the comic strip. And instead of being competitors, they used to help each other. When, when one club needed a comedian, if somebody didn't show up, they'd call because they were only a couple of blocks away. Right. And so they would feed each other comedians. And so Billy Crystal came over to do the opening night show. And uh, I got to talk to all of those people, which was really great. We did all uh, – most of the interviews were done at the comic strip because when you're in an environment like that, it brings back memories. Yeah. Which, again, is in this book because – I talk a lot about cellular memory, which I think is fascinating. Every single thing that's ever happened to you since you were born is still inside of you. Every, every, t everything that you experienced in all of your senses. So it's the reason that you could hear a song that you like and it will remind you of the girl you liked in the third grade. That definitely and, and is And it comes true. back like yeah. that. You smell a perfume, right? And you're like, oh, my kindergarten teacher wore that perfume. Yeah. And it, there's no thought involved. It happens immediately. It's like a sensory deja vu. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful. And every, unfortunately, every traumatic experience that you've ever had is trapped inside of you, not just you, inside of all of us. Mm -hmm. And that's the essence of this healing your heart thing, is that we need to get rid of those things. We need to come to grips with them and realize that a lot of those things are not true. They're not valid for us. They hold us back. They create fear. They create doubt. They tell us that we can't accomplish the things that we want to accomplish in life. And that's not true. 
we're all, you know, we have we all have the same 46 chromosomes. If you and I conquered stuttering, there are three million people out there who stutter. A lot of them could be helped. Yeah, definitely. And nobody's telling them that. You know, I called the Stuttering Institute, a well-known stuttering institute, to ask if I could be helpful with my technique. And I used the doctor thing so I could get the head of the thing on, you know, on the phone because a lot of people don't just come on the phone, you know. Mm-hmm. And he had the nerve to say to me that no one has ever been cured of stuttering. He really said that. And I said, mm. that, that, I said that I must be a pathological liar. I made up the whole thing because I'm talking to you for 15 minutes. You don't hear me stuttering, right? And I was a bad stutterer. And he wouldn't concede. And I said, I was just calling to see if I could be helpful in some way. And, and that told me... Because if you cured it, they'd be out of a job. Probably. You know? And, you know, they too, as, as speech therapists, they don't know what causes stuttering. To no. this day, people don't know. It could be many different factors. And not everybody can be cured the way we were. But I tell people who contact me, I get, you know, I don't advertise, but people find me on the internet. And I tell them, read my website. Yeah. And if what I wrote makes sense to you, then there's a good chance that I can help you. Because my website's crazy. I don't know if you saw it, but it's mostly comedy and stuff. I've seen. But then there's like a whole thing about an about column on uh, my curing for headaches and spirituality and healing and um, stuttering, my cure for stuttering. And words are very powerful. So I always tell them, if the words make sense to you, then there's a good chance that what I do can help you. It also seems like the words stutterer and stuttering were just meant to uh, trap people who can't say it. Yeah, right. Isn't that right? something? It's like, Isn't that something? let's make something really difficult just to screw with them even more. So, <laughs> like, they already can't say this. Let's add a couple more R's in there. R's in there to make it difficult. <laughs> I know. It's, it's amazing. So when did you actually stop? Like, when did you find that? Um, you- I kind of stopped uh, middle school, high school. I think I kind of figured it out in sixth and seventh grade. I did some uh, children's theater productions. Really? My sister was an actor person, musical theater person, and I would get grouped in to do stage crew and understudy because she was in. My mom was like a stage manager at mom, and it was um, small children's theater productions, community theater productions. So I kind of got roped into community theater I was doing stage crew. I was doing lights. Um, you know, I was wearing all black. I had a little headset. <laughs> and it was fun. And um, I, you know, would have to learn lines, and I would be in some rehearsals. And, you know, I was bad at remembering my lines. But just the idea of being on stage, getting over the terror, and being able to perform in front of an audience and the lights. And when I was prompted to have to act, I wouldn't stutter. And I kind of realized I, it was like, you know, a light bulb moment where I kind of unlocked that part of my brain. I was like, oh, huh. I don't stutter when I act and I don't stutter when I sing. Right. You become someone else. Exactly. And, you know, you just reminded me of something that I didn't remember for a while. When I was in high school, I had a very bad experience. The teacher called on me to answer a question and I stood up and I couldn't say it. nothing came out. Literally zero came out. And I just stood there. And again, I remember it like it was yesterday. I could feel the heat in my body, and my face just turned red, like bright red. And I stood there, and she said, can you tell me the answer? And I couldn't say Nothing would come out. Yeah. And I just sat down. And I made myself sign up for a speech class in college, not um, not a speech therapy class, a, a class where I had to give speeches. Yeah. Because I was riddled with fear as a kid. And I always made myself confront my fears. I hated the fact that things made me nervous. And my whole life I've been confronting uncomfortability. And I, I signed up for this class where I had to give speeches, and I never stuttered. And the other kids would say to me, how how'd you do that? How could you speak like that? And in my mind, I think I became someone else. Yeah, you're playing a role of I you. I played a role of a guy who didn't stutter. Yeah. It was Jeffrey who didn't stutter. Yeah. And I would get up there, and then afterward, I would start stuttering to people. Yeah, and like the moment about, after you stop, yeah. And that's what I, 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 I use those thoughts, that it doesn't make sense. 
It doesn't make sense. It, theoretically, if I could speak fine sometimes, I should be able to speak fine all the time. Yeah. You can't have a disability based on your location. It doesn't right? make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's brain and stuff. So from I don't know. doing it for years and years of teaching myself it doesn't make sense, I was able to stop. But I was very nervous. I remember this very clearly. I was really scared before I stopped stuttering because as much as you hate something about yourself, it makes you nervous to change because who will you be? It was so much a part of my identity that how would I exist without that bondage, yeah. you know? And and it took a while for me to get accustomed to it. Like I felt like I have to, I'd have to make excuses to people. Why am I not stuttering? But no one was disappointed. No one said you can't come in here unless you stutter. There was, no, <laughs> you know what I mean? There was no uh, bad side to it. There was no downside. Uh, but there's a tendency to think that you need to stay the same in your life. Mm -hmm. It takes courage to change. Yeah. You know? And that's important for people to know because people who are listening to this, they're facing their own obstacles. Most people who are listening to this are not stutterers, but they may know someone who stutters uh, because it touches a, a lot of people. But they certainly have obstacles in their lives that they have to overcome. And just to know that you can do that through the power of your mind, you know, there are certain things that you must accept. There is, you know, are you familiar with the serenity prayer? It says, right. grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the most important line is, and the wisdom to know the difference. Right. If I hadn't been given the grace to figure out that there was really nothing wrong with me, I'd still be stuttering today. And as you do, I use my voice in everything I do, whether I'm doing a radio show, a podcast, a TV thing, on stage lecturing, just talking to people. Every, it's on my mind every day, mm -hmm. and, and I'm grateful. Are you grateful? Do you think about it? I am. Yeah, I think about it. I, I like, um, I think the more that I've been talking, I, it's like I once I learned how to talk without stuttering and without speech impediment, I just, I never shut up after that moment. Me too. Like I Me never too. wanted to stop talking yeah, after exactly. I figured out how to do it. After being um, like handcuffed for such a long time, handcuffed is a great. And I, it was like analogy. I was free, and I and I I won't shut up. Like anybody, not even just on a microphone, like just like small talking in the office. Like I won't stop talking to people. I always want to be talking to people. It's a fun thing to be a communicator. It's wonderful, and I I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's a gift. It's it a is true a gift. gift. And you know, I use affirmations a lot to to reprogram people's thinking. These positive affirmations, and one of them is fluency is freedom. Because it's such a tremendous freedom. And I tell people that I work with who are stuttering, picture how you'll feel one day when you no longer have to stutter. Mm -hmm. Picture that freedom when you no longer have to choose your words or switch words. Stutterers become great. They have great vocabularies because they're always switching words. Yeah. If they get to a word they can't say, immediately they switch to a different word. And I teach them how not to do that because you don't want to ever give that power away. There's no word that you can't say. There's no reason to switch any word. Yeah. And as soon as you do that, you're giving in. Fear is a bully. Fear wants you to stay in bed every day, pull the covers up, and do nothing. You know, Fear tells you that you can't accomplish your goals. Yeah. And I hate it. Yeah. And, you know, I was given that fear as a kid. I don't know what it was, you know. Uh, my mother kept me in a crib till I was six and a half years old. Can you believe that? Did the crib have a lid on it, Jeffrey? <laughs> it should have. I remember my grandfather bought me a two-wheeler bicycle for my birthday, and I climbed out of my crib to, to, to try that two-wheeler bicycle. And I was like, Ma, why'd you do that to me? Who yeah. cares? That's a, she claimed it was a, like a space thing. I don't know. Thank God my sister was finally born so that she got the crib, and I was able to get out and have a, like a bed. But I think it gave me a lot of fears, you know, like I wasn't allowed to cross the street and, you know, until I was like uh, 10, I don't know, by, by myself. <laughs> so you went, you went to school for dentistry. Yeah, I, I studied, I went to Temple University in Philadelphia. And then you were a... Uh, worst four years of my life. And then I and then You I were practicing dentist for... For a long time. Long time. I, I, my specialty was cosmetics. And then I became a professor at NYU. I was a... Uh, uh, um, a clinical professor in the oral medicine and oral facial pain department. And my specialty was treating stress-related illness, like people... Grind with, their teeth. With headaches. Yeah. yeah, yeah, clenching and grinding. That's a big deal. Causes so many problems. Yeah. Oh, people have no idea. I used to grind my teeth, and I used to, when I was growing up, because I, I had two sisters, and they could, they could hear it because it's loud. So I was grinding, and then I'd also like... Well, like, that... 
clamp. During the day, people would clench their teeth. I'd clench and at night and when grind. they were sleeping, they grind. It's amazing. You have everything that my, I'm talking my about. My jaw would hurt so right. badly. People I got wake up terrible in the morning. headaches. Yeah. yeah. They wake up in the morning, their neck hurts, their shoulders, their back hurts. And if you wake up in the morning and your neck hurts, the last person in the world you would think to tell would be your dentist. Why yeah. would you ever tell your dentist that your neck hurts? And so, unfortunately, most dentists don't check for that. Most physicians don't know the symptoms of grinding. They call it bruxism is the formal word for clenching and grinding. It does a lot of damage. Yeah. And in this country alone, there's more than 150 million people that are plagued with what they think are migraine headaches that very often are musculoskeletal headaches that come from overuse of the muscles of your jaw. And the muscles of your jaw connect into your shoulders, into the back of your head, and into the temple region. And so, so many people get these terrible, incapacitating headaches, and, that's and they from have stress. no idea. Stress? It's from stress. Yeah, they have no idea that it's from that. I've been wearing a night guard for many years. That's just another obstacle that I had to overcome. Yeah, when I was in dental school, I thought I had lockjaw. I couldn't open my mouth in the morning, and I went to the clinic, and they diagnosed me as a grinder. I didn't know I was grinding. Most people don't know that they're doing it. Yeah, because you can't. I mean, sometimes you don't. Sometimes maybe you wake yourself up, but mostly you don't. I had people grind their teeth down to little stubs who would insist that they weren't grinders. Ouch. <laughs> and, and, like when they smile, you can't even see teeth anymore because the teeth get so short yeah. unless you wear a night guard. So how did you cure that for yourself? Um, I ground my teeth through high school-ish, and then I kind of stopped when I, I... I was a very wound up uh, high school kid. I was very stressed about college and class and and grades, and then... Once I got into college, and I, I went to art school, I went to Syracuse for art. Oh, really? Um, I think once I chose a path that I was happy in, I was m- I was much better. I was much better in every way, and um, I would Isn't still... That interesting? That's an interesting concept, too. Not to interrupt you, but once you find your true path, the, the, uh, the, excuse me, the universe supports you in yeah. that. So it's like you can try different things, because life is confusing. Sometimes we think we're supposed to do something else. And it doesn't work out. I can always tell when I'm making the wrong choice. I can always tell when I'm in a situation that I hate. I don't last very long. Like some people are in jobs for very long time. years that they hate. Or they're in bad relationships or married for a very – like I know immediately when something's terrible and I – because I I physically can't sleep and I can't Mm -hmm. do – like my body rejects bad choices very quickly. Like I can't last. Yeah, you're very lucky. And then I make a choice and I get out of something and then I feel immediately just like a weight – is lifted and I can so I mean even it's strange like it's not even necessarily money related with like work and stuff it's just like if I'm unhappy or unfulfilled creatively like I get so miserable that I have to change it like I can't last and that's fascinating it's so, weird so you've conquered all the things that I'm talking about which I've is tried so interesting. like accident no, but it's you know? just funny that you've had that experience so that was my specialty and I used to use energy like what I was teaching in the clinic was that you can take away headaches by using your hands, the transfer of energy is very is that like powerful. This? No, uh, when you rub I, the skin uh, between no, your thumb and finger. I put my finger? hands on people's heads mm. and I take away. I, I open up the muscles. Like, have, have you ever had a cramp in your calf? You know yeah. how how painful that is. Like right? a Charlie horse kind of. Uh, like a Charlie right. horse thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, the calf is a fleshy muscle, so it's obvious when it cramps. Your head feels like it's bone. But it's really, it's bone covered by a very thin layer of muscle. Mm. There are all these muscles on top of your head. And when those cramp up, it's not as obvious. You don't feel it like you do in your calf. But the muscles still close down. And inside those muscles are nerves and blood vessels. And when you close down on nerves and blood vessels, that's where the pounding headache comes from. Mm -hmm. The blood can't flow. I used to get migraine headaches growing up. Right. But they're not true migraine headaches. Yeah. And that's what's interesting because migraine headaches, you usually get what's called a prodrome. Very often people will see like flashing yellow lights. They get an aura, it's called. And those are true migraine headaches. But you can get what seem like migraine headaches from clenching and grinding. Yeah. Because the muscles go into spasm, the pain can get so bad that people are suicidal. I've treated people like that, and I used to make these soft night guards for people to wear when they sleep to keep their teeth apart. As a matter of fact, the, uh, a lot of weightlifters and football players use these what they call MORA appliances, M-O-R-A, mandibular orthognathic repositioning appliances that reposition the position of your jaw. Mm-hmm. It seems that 
the TMJ, which is the temporomandibular joint, is considered a master joint in the body. It controls not only how your head feels, which is important enough, but it controls how your whole body feels. It gives you physical strength. If your TMJ is stressed out from grinding, your body will feel weak. You'll feel tired all the time and listless and maybe dizzy and you won't have any energy. But what they find is that their physical strength improves by wearing one of these appliances and they can lift more weight and they're more effective on the football field. Mm. And it's really very interesting that this controls how your whole body feels as a master joint energetically. So I used to work on that in the clinic. And because I was there for 12 years, they let me lecture to the postgraduate doctors, which has nothing to do with comedy. No, it doesn't. So when did you (laughs) – So, but on top of all these things and being a a dentist and being a a professor and being an author, you also do stand-up comedy like all of the time. All the time, yeah. And you're a regular in the clubs. Uh, You've written books about stand-up. You've interviewed everybody. You've been on red carpets with everybody. I've seen photos of you with everybody. I'm, um, doing, I'm doing a big one this coming Tuesday. It's the Garden of Laughs. Where's that? Uh, it's at Madison Square Garden, and it's uh, they do it every two years. Rory Rosegarten, who handles Ray Romano, produces this show, and uh, it's Jerry Seinfeld and Bill Burr, Michael Che, uh, just a long list of all the top comedians who are going to be there, plus sports figures, and they all come out and they give their time to raise money for children with disabilities. And it's a, it's a huge event, and I'll be on the red carpet this Tuesday, April 2nd, interviewing everybody. Uh, for Comedy Matters TV? Yeah, for Comedy Matters TV, yeah. Just go to comedymatters.tv? Uh, no, it's actually, the YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Gurian News Network. Okay. GNN. GNN. But, but it's Gurian News Network. And it's interviews. I have over 500 interviews with Jimmy Fallon and Chelsea Handler and Jim Carrey and John Stewart and everybody all the way down. You know, Nick Kroll and John Mulaney, my boys. Oh, I love you know, them. I'm the first. Do you know that I'm the first to be pranked with too much tuna? Did they base these characters off of you <laughs> that they're doing for Oh Hello? I feel like you could be on Oh Hello. I was on as a Oh walk Hello. On. They, ha- they, they ha- no, they had me open the show for them on Broadway. They made me a jacket. I guess you never saw it. Do you know who Curtis Slewa is? The Guardian Angels. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, they made me an exact replica of his jacket, but mine says Gurian Angels, and they made me the head of security for <laughs> oh, oh Hello. And we did the show when they did the. The show at the Just for Laughs Festival in Montreal, mm-hmm. where I go every year for more than 25 years, mm-hmm. they had me present the big tuna sandwich to Judd Apatow. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a crazy thing. I'm their guy. and so I'm, But I'm literally the first person to be pranked with too much tuna on Comedy Central. And it went viral. It's got about 800,000 views now. And then they had me come back to do a, a, a sketch with Katy Perry and Amy Poehler and Seth Rogen. And it was Katy Perry's comedy debut. That's so great. I got to do that with her. Yeah, it was fun. You know, look, I used to write for Rodney Dangerfield and Joan Rivers. And while I was in practice, I mm-hmm. was writing for the Friars Roast for many years and Richard Belzer. And I did a film with Gilbert Gottfried. And I used to do all that. But that was before I started performing. Yeah. Now, I've, I've even performed on your show. You do shows Guaranteed here. Guaranteed delivery. We actually have a show this uh, April 2nd, also on really? Tuesday, oh, yeah. downstairs in the mailroom. 110 Wall Street. Free tickets are available. Check it out at weeklyhumorous.com. We have Rosebud Baker. I love Rosebud. Isn't she so she's funny? so funny. I'm yeah. so excited yeah. she's doing the show because she's going to be so... like she's. I feel like she's she's on that cusp of already being famous, but like not household name famous, but I feel like she's going to be household yeah, name famous very, hard very soon. Say. Like she's... She's amazing. Like when Amy Schumer first started. Yeah. yeah. Like it's it's fun meeting. I mean, we all not to not to discount anyone that's on the show. We have Mark Norman on the show uh, on Mark Tuesday. We have Sean sure. Donnelly. We have Matthew Broussard. Um, it's a packed it's show a of lineup. like. And as I said, I've been to those shows and they're all great. You always do a really good job. It's a great space. And it's a wonderful space. One Ten Wall Street. One Ten Wall Street downstairs <laughs> in the mail room. Where we are at this delivery. moment. Go to guaranteedelivery TV for tickets. Yeah, but she's just like exceptionally funny. You know when you you've seen so much stand up, right? You see God, so I've much. I've seen so much. And it's yeah. so it's so cool when you see somebody who's just like they have that special it factor where they can they have a, a routine where they are not they don't need an audience to be even there. You know, like they don't even need an audience. 
they could be because I saw her do a show. My friend, um, oh, you know, uh, Keenan Steiner. Sure, yeah. Okay, so Keenan does this great show. It's called Comedy at the Corner. He also has a show on Tuesday, but don't go to his. Just kidding. Uh, but his is in Fort Greene at uh, Hungry Ghost Coffee Shop, and it's very small, right? It's a small, small coffee shop. And he does this show called Comedy at the Corner, and he gets good comics to come out. And it's a very tiny audience, and it's in a coffee shop, so it's like it's every stereotype about like hipster Brooklyn <laughs> comedy shows you could possibly fit into one tiny coffee shop. But I saw Rosebud Baker there. She did amazing. There was like five people in the audience or less, but it, was, it didn't matter. It could have been zero people in the, in the that audience. That is such a hard thing to do. And she delivered, and she was so funny. Have you done stand-up? No. Mar- I just, I'm a fan. Does it ever appeal to you? To always. Try it, I've to always, try it, it's yeah. my secret dream. Yeah. Is to be, I used to just like fantasize about being a famous stand-up comic. Well, it's so hard. Things to are do. so funny in your head, and then you say them, and it's like, God, that's not, that's not funny at all. Well, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's the hardest thing to do to, to to get up on a stage and try to convince strangers that what you think is yeah. funny is actually funny. Even if I can be funny right here, I still can't do it on a stage in front of lights in front of a crowd. Well, that's what people don't get. It's very different being funny with your friends. Yeah, it, the, uh, that's basically having a good personality. Right. When you can be funny and, and loquacious with your friends, it's very different doing that on stage. Yeah. The audience doesn't care about inside jokes. What no. your friend did at the office. Right. You know what I mean? That doesn't play well on stage. You have to kind of be prepared with material. And people find that out when they do open mics. You got to come up with something. It's rough. You ever want to watch just like, I mean, talk about cringeworthy. Going to an open mic with really, I mean, there's sometimes hilarious people at open mics because they're just like workshopping a joke. Mm -hmm. But the people that have absolutely never done it before, like to go up there and watch them just like die for five minutes or just like, wow. All they have to do is talk about going to the bathroom. This is horrible. That drives me crazy. You're supposed to outgrow that when you're nine. But there's there's still comedians who insist they must talk about that. And I, to me, that's a pet peeve. I hate that. If that's the funniest thing that you can think of as an adult, then maybe you should rethink your career. To me, you know, look, I always like, like, uh, I was at Jerry Seinfeld's Netflix taping because he came back to the comic strip to do that, you know. And I always admire a wordsmith. He's, he's a master wordsmith, you know. And when those guys came up, there was no cable TV, so they always work clean. Yeah. And I don't always work clean. I drop some F-bombs. I don't talk about objectionable topics. Though. Right. But I'll say this fucking thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Can you No, we're, Yeah, no one's listening. Oh, okay. It's fine. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> uh, I, but once in a while, I'll do that. And I had a perform recently. I was at the, uh, the West Side Comedy Club. And Jerry happened to come in to do a set, and he was there, and he said hi, and I went up. Somebody was supposed to perform before, and they decided to split. I don't know if it was because they saw Jerry or whatever. And the next thing I know, the manager goes, Jeffrey, you're up. And so I'm up, and Jerry's there. And every time I cursed, I felt bad. Because yeah. I knew he was there. Like, I didn't have to. Right. I throw that in. I can work clean if I need to, you yeah. know, if, it, if, it, if it's called for. But in, the, in a club, you tend to cater to the audience yeah there are comedians who don't cater to the audience they just stick true to what they want to do but i tend to do that you know and i just felt guilty every time i said the f word when jerry was there yeah (laughs) because he and george wallace and paul reiser all the guys that came up together at that time if you wanted to do tv you couldn't work like that and jim gaffigan can work so exactly exactly jim gaffigan is a great example of that and uh you know, and he's he's always on tour. By the way, always he's, he's amazing. I don't think he's it's because he has so many kids. He just he, always wants to be yeah. traveling. He told me he wanted me to be <laughs> one of his kids. <laughs> <laughs> I have that in one of my videos. It was so cool. He said he and uh, Jeannie were talking about it, and they thought that I should be one of their kids. They're going to adopt you? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> you get to be a gaff again. They're talking about it. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. You have I, to get paler. You have to yeah, get I'm much paler. paler. I'm way too much color as it is. God, I've had skin cancer twice already. Have you really? Yeah, well, I was a schmuck when I was a kid. I, 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 my goal was to be tan, and I brought a reflector to Puerto Rico. Who does that? Wow. I wound up in the hospital. Wow. A, a, a literal, a ref, I don't even know if they make them anymore. You know what a reflector is? That yeah. That thing with, you got, with the you got silver extra paper crispy. Yeah. I, my face blew off. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. L- laying on the beach in Puerto Rico with a reflector. I literally I had to go to the hospital. They didn't know what was going to happen to me. So... But you look great I've now. I've been tan. <laughs> it was always my goal to be tan. I got stripes, you know. But I, so I wound up, I had skin cancer twice because of that. So I don't do that anymore. No, it's good. I'm, 
resign to the fact that I have no pigment and that's it. You don't need it. But when it comes to pale, yeah, he's at the top. At the top. At the top of the list. So you're performing, well, you're going to be doing the red carpet on Tuesday. But you perform a lot, though. Yeah, this weekend I'm doing two shows at Lucy's Lounge in Pleasantville. Uh, last night I was at the Grizzly Pear. Um, I, I see that a lot. I see the Grizzly Pear kind of everywhere these days. They really turned it around. Yeah. Kenny Warren and Gabe Dorado did an amazing thing. They, you know, because it was a bar yeah. with a room in the back. I think I see, mm, is it Joe Alfino? Joe Alfano. Alfano? Well, maybe, I, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. I think I'm. Too. I, I always pronounce. I always see. The Kenny thing Warren of, took it over. It's only those two guys. Now, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, look, there are probably other people who produce shows there. Mm hmm. But oh yeah, yeah. The, the main shows now are Kenny Warren and Gabe Dorado, and they're packing the place. Yeah, it's and a big they, room. What they did was they took beautiful pictures of each comedian and put them up on the wall. They had uh, an artist, like a photographer, take professional photos and make a real poster, not just a paper poster, but like on on uh, board, mm -hmm. like a foam core. Yeah. Everyone gets their thing on the wall. They had me come in to sign mine. That's nice. And it's a really nice feeling. Yeah, it elevates the... You feel like you belong to something. classiness. Yeah, yeah. Like you really feel like you belong like to something. Like the old time, was it Sardis? When they'd have yeah, like sorry, the old, yeah, exactly. old school? Yeah, exactly. where they had the pictures. Yeah, it makes you feel fancier. It's it makes like, you feel better about it's yourself. It's like my apartment. You should come over. So you see, if you like... You're, you're in Manhattan, aren't you? Yeah, you Upper East? I, I have like a comedy museum. Midtown East. Yeah, Midtown in, East. In the East 50s. And... When Richie Tinkin came to my place, he goes, you have more pictures than I have in the club. <laughs> <laughs> my pictures go back a long time because, you know, I got to write for Jerry Lewis. And Milton Berle was my sponsor in the Friars Club. You remember the name Milton Berle? Of course. You know who that is? Yeah. A lot I of love the Friars these Club. Days didn't know. I was a member for many, many years. And Milton was my sponsor. Are it you still a member? A honor. No, not recently. No, I just go I'm as a guest. I don't feel like, jo you know, I feel I'm a, I'm a freeloader. I don't but feel it's like a wonderful place yeah, to be. Yeah, it's a great place There's to be. There's so much history there. The Milton Burrow Room. Yeah, the Milton Burrow Room. Know, and, uh, There's the Billy Crystal Room. Bi There's the Lucio Crystal Ball. The Bar downstairs. The sauna up there. There's a sauna at like the yeah, top. Yeah, there's a sauna and a work room, uh, like a, a workout room. You can get a haircut. You certainly can. I don't do that, yeah. but, but people are known to do that. And then they have, uh, there's a whole floor just for women. I got drinks there forever ago with uh, Lou Wallach. You know Lou. Lou Wallach, of I course. Love Lou. Wallach Media. Wallach Media. Lou, Lou was the president of uh, Comedy Central for a while. He was for a while. He's, for years. He's big time. Absolutely. Um, and I was there, and I had the lobster salad. Food I always there is get great. It. Lobster and avocado salad is the greatest thing. If you ever go to the Friars Club, get the lobster avocado salad. And also go with a member because you cannot pay. Oh, yeah. yeah, You cannot pay. That's why I I, I, I only go as a guest yeah. because they have to pay for they me. I pay. cannot they, pay for it if I go to the Friars no Club. No money can exchange for <laughs> the Friars Club. And it's so crazy. When I went, uh, you know, as a kid, like I said, I admit I actually got to write jokes for Milton Berle for mm -hmm. the roast, you know, and I got to write uh, – for 12 years, I was the head writer for the Friars Roast. There was a guy named Bob Sachs who was the producer of the roast, and I was his writer, and I got to write for everybody that they were roasting, of Bruce Willis mm -hmm. and Jerry Lewis and uh, Chuck Scarborough, the, an unusual group of people that yeah. were being roasted every year. And the Friars Club was an amazing place, and it was legendary, and it was so exciting just to step in there. Yeah. You know, I had always been a comedy fan since the time I was a kid. Anytime there was a comedian, like on the Ed Sullivan show, I would like race in to watch, you know? Yeah. Most people, were you drawn to comedy as a kid? Yeah, always. I was always into comedy. My dad was a big comedy fan and exposed me to comedy movies and stuff. Me too. Really My dad early. used to take me to see the Marx Brothers and yeah. Marlon Hardy. And I would like, watch, I was a huge silent movie. I would watch a lot of Chaplin growing up. Uh -huh. I was really into Chaplin movies, really into Laurel and Hardy, really into Buster Keaton. Yeah. Um, I loved W.C. Fields. W.C. Fields. That's so cool that you know. Yeah. See, and I find it very interesting because when you establish that as a child, you carry that through very often. It's a lifelong love for comedy. It is. When you learn the old, like the old, old world of comedy, uh, like the silent comedy almost too, and like uh, words more pantomime jokes. Well, Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it, when you were able to make a joke that was like. Uh, universally understood mm -hmm. it wasn't even language based i thought that was fantastic to be able to make a joke situationally just by the actions i was really into this, uh, all the silent movies and stuff it was amazing how they could 
But what's crazy to me is that that could never happen these days. You could never have a Laurel and Hardy again. No agent would represent them. It mm -hmm. would be considered lame. But yet people still think they're hilarious. There's could, a new movie out. I don't know if you saw it. Stan and Ali. Uh, yes. With, uh, I haven't oh, seen it. Oh, it's, it's John C. Riley. John C. Riley. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember who played uh, Stan Laurel. He was also very good. A British actor. Yeah. But John C. Riley was incredible as Oliver Hardy. I still think of that I have, little dance you know, that they did. Those statues, I don't think I have a photo on me. I don't know. They were like the 60s, 70s. They had these funny statues of famous comedian people with the big heads. And it oh, was that a small body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They used to be everywhere. But I have a, a Laurel and Hardy set of these statues that were like big in the 60s, 70s. I have a, I have a, I have a W.C. Fields one. And then I have I a Laurel and Hardy set. Fields. He, I used to do W.C. Fields nights in college. I would arrange them for people to come and watch the... W.C. Fields films at the school. There's no two man groups. The closest you come is Nick Kroll and John Mulaney these yeah. days. You know who are amazing and they're very together. funny together. Yes, they're great. But there's no two man groups. It's yeah. not. It's not considered like a hip thing in comedy to right. have two man group. You know, like George Burns and Gracie Allen. Yeah, a straight man and a comedian. And like the laughing guys. You don't see that. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You don't. Rowan and Martin. Right? right. You don't see that anymore. The Smothers Brothers. Smothers Brothers. Right. Yeah. Oh, they were great. You don't see that. No. And I, and I think that if someone came along and wanted to do it, I don't think they'd get any play. Comedy has changed so much. <sighs> Maybe Flight of the Concords, guys? I mean, they're very Maybe. music. They're very music based. Yeah, very music based. But I mean, but, they sort of had that Smothers Brothers, but they weren't. They're more music than they are jokes. Look, there was another. There was never another Monty Python. I always wanted to be involved with the Pythons. I wrote a, a film called "Men Who Walk Low for a Living and Enjoy It" before they did the Ministry of Silly Walks, mm. and I got to meet Nancy Lewis, who was their manager at the time, and I showed her the film, and she thought it was great. And I thought the Pythons were going to welcome me in, just like when I met Woody Allen when I was a kid and I showed him all my material. I thought he was going to say, Jeffrey, let's make movies together. And, and, you know, he actually read all my material and he invited me back to the theater to hang with him the next night. Uh, but he never said, let's make movies yeah. together. But he did <laughs> say to me, he goes, your stuff's very visual and you should really think of making a film out of it, which I did some years later. I did this uh, series of films for... What festival was that? The Toyota Comedy Festival. And it was the Men Who series, about men who do very unusual things, like men who take a pitchfork to the movies, men who enjoy Latin dancing with tools. Yeah. You've seen a lot of Latin dancing with tools, but have, have you ever seen a guy do the tango with a wrench? I have not. Probably not. No, Probably I, not. I had, a, he, I had a guy who was the best Latin dancer with tools. He could do the merengue with an extension ladder. That was just <laughs> incredible. That, yeah. So I have all these films. I videotape them. And I actually, some of my films were in the Cannes Film Festival, the short film corner. Yeah. Um, those animated films I did, uh, Man Robs Bank with His Chin, College Professor Fired for Casually Removing His Spine. Mm. And well, you know, you can't do that. Not you allowed. can't remove body parts. No. And then he would ask the students to help him reinsert his spine. And the students were like, we don't want that responsibility. No. What if it goes in wrong? Exactly. You know what I mean? And who knows what could happen? You never you know. know. You never know. And then there was like a, the true story of George Washington's uh, wooden pants. Yes, the wooden pants. Wooden, a lot of people thought he had wooden teeth. That's a story that's up on Weekly Humorous. People can actually find uh, a lot of your stuff is up on Weekly Humorous. That's right. And an you know, that's page. why he stood up in the boat in that yeah. famous painting. You can't sit down. That, can't sit down. <laughs> Very hard. It's a historical thing. Those wooden pants are in the Smithsonian Institute. Oh, another one that people always read is your article, um, The History of Thumb Twiddling. It's a very yes, yeah. a very it goes back to ancient Egyptian yep. times, the history of thumb twiddling. Yeah. Exactly, lots of People factual stuff of is I buried. Spent, I haven't slept in years researching these stories. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, you know, like uh, rare, uh, rare virus sweeps Japan, victims too weak to bow. Yep. You know, yep. man impaled on spike still shows up for work on time. It's a good employee. Which is a hard thing. To, well, he. He had never been late for work. And he said, you know, when he had the spike removed, he said it wasn't that painful. He figured he could still show up at the office. If you have a streak. He actually went with the spike, but he said it was hard to close his jacket because most designers don't make jackets to fit over a spike. That you was think his that main they complaint. would. But he wasn't late, and that's the key. With the niche market these days, there is an opening for everybody. <laughs> for everybody. The book is called Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind. 
a spiritual and humorous approach to achieving happiness. Yes, and it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble wherever there is still a bookstore open. But there is, it is available on Amazon, and it would be great if you check it out. I hope that people listening will check it out and see the dog meditating. It's in great. Lotus position. And I'll have a link. Uh, we'll put a link on the website, and we'll awesome. put a photo of the book, of course, on the website because it's fun. Cool. And uh, yeah, this is awesome. And people uh, can follow you on. On Twitter, Twitter and, and Instagram. Instagram. I'm at Jeffrey Gurian on both, on Twitter and Instagram. My website is ComedyMattersTV.com. Okay. And it would be great if they check out the uh, YouTube channel. Comedy Matters TV on YouTube is YouTube.com slash Gurian News Network. Yep. And there's videos with everybody. Well, all your faves. All the big ones. Like all everybody ones. famous who's ever been in comedy, Jeffrey has met, and they know him, and he's... You're like the insider guide to comedy. <laughs> Paul Provenza said, like, I'm a genetic marker yeah. for comedians. If you don't know me, you can't be in comedy. It's true. <laughs> like, if you don't know Jeffrey Gurian, you aren't a comedian. I don't know. It's like, if they don't know who so you strange. are, that's like a litmus test. It's a very strange thing. But Kroll said that. And uh, it's on. There's a video. It says, who? Again. Do you have cursing or no? Sure, you can oh. curse as much. It's as called you. "Who the Fuck Is Jeffrey Gurian," and it starts with Mark Maron and it ends with John Mulaney addressing the entire industry up at Just for Laughs. And I was not in the room. Yeah. And he says he pictures a day when he's walking through a hotel lobby and he sees this photograph, uh, and Andy Kindler is in the photograph rolling his eyes. And the picture was taken by Jeffrey Gurian. He goes, and if you don't know who Jeffrey Gurian is, if you see a guy and you go, who the fuck is that? That's Jeffrey Gurian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about right. And somebody taped that and sent it to me. I wasn't in the room. And when he said it, and it was, I thought it was so funny that I made it the ending of this video. Yeah. That's Crow, awesome. Kroll and Mulaney are my guys. They're like, you know. They're so funny. They're just so funny. They're hilarious. And look, when when John hosted SNL recently, yeah. one of the best hosts of all time. One of the best episodes that they've so, had in a so long time. So funny. All the sketches, the sketches were great. so funny. He's just so clever. You can always tell. I mean, some of the most uh, interesting, funny, and, and like conceptual pieces were on that episode. Exactly. And Kroll's show. Yeah. Why, why Nick stopped in big three mouth seasons? Yeah, big so mouth is just funny. so great. People Such love a good that show. show. I was at the premiere at the Y, and his parents were there, and I met his parents many times, so I know them. So I was sitting near them and watching them laugh, and I was thinking, how do you do that kind of comedy when your parents are there? You know what I mean? I'm still, I'm still in that mindset. It's such a gentle, to... funny show that's dirty, but it's, it's so filthy, it's, but it's filthy, it's, but it's in a really charismatic storytelling kind of way well, where his you was care. Hysterical. His mother's so cool. But yeah. His dad is a very serious businessman and he was laughing too. And I just like, I was admiring him for being able to do that, for having the freedom to have your parents there and do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Because you know? I'm too closed. Yeah. That. <laughs> it's incredible. It would be too hard for me to do. But uh, anyway, I hope people will check out the book. Yeah, check, check out, out the book. The thank you for being on the show, and, Jeffrey Gurian. It's me, so Marty. nice. It's nice. I'm so happy that I got to meet you such a long time ago, and I've known you for so long. And uh, you know, you're always you're. I always see you popping up to, at different projects, at different places. Um, your column uh, is it hopping around? Jumping, Jumping around, around with Jeffrey, Jeffrey Gurian, Gurian, yes. Where you kind of just know where all the hot comics are performing at all the hot shows that week. Um, it's great. You're 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 in the mix all the time. I'm in the mix. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you for being here. I hope yes. to be at your next show. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's first Tuesdays of the month, so the next one in May. Um come to any any of them you want to come to. It's always a better show when you're around. Thanks. And hopefully um, one day you'll have me on. You've been again. on before. I know I was on. I know I was on. <laughs> you you did great. <laughs> Thanks. And I you've been just as an audience member, and you've co you come to cover it. I love to support, um, write about it. Yeah. That's one thing. You know, I never write about things that I don't like. People always say, oh, you always only write good things. And that's all I want to – because I know how hard it is to perform. So if somebody does a bad show, I don't write about it. Mm -hmm. I hate critics. I hate people who criticize other people and don't do it themselves. These yeah. movie critics, these yeah. theater critics, they probably have never acted. They probably never put on a show themselves. They have no idea how hard it is. Anybody can have a bad show. Yeah. So when I see something that I don't like, I just don't write about it. But yeah. when I see something that I do like, I love to support talented people and people that are working hard. Yeah. 
and you are very dedicated to what you do. So when I come to a show and it's good, I like to write about it and let people know. That was a good one too. That was uh, we had uh, Wendy Starling, Nico White. Um, yeah, Nico is great. Amazing. He started out like he was fifteen. Yeah, he used to do my late night show. I was hosting at the comic strip for two years. Me and Jordan Rock, Chris's mm-hmm. younger brother, we used to. Uh, switch off I would do Sunday and Monday he did Tuesday and Wednesday and we hosted the late night show at the comic strip and Nico was one of the people that would come by and start out so he's like I've a prodigy him, he's, he, like a, he's, he's so great started so young yeah, and now he's hosting all the time he's at New York Comedy a lot yeah and he's just a great host and a really funny guy and a nice guy it's fun watching people start and then rise fast and then get on that late night spot and then because mm-hmm. I mean, when it happens it happens quick for a it lot happens of these guys. really quick. Yeah. Well, and to the public, it may seem like it happens quick, but I see them in the clubs working so yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not and easy, it's stage time. Yeah, it's stage time. They put in a lot of stage time. Yeah. You got to be out there every night. They're out there. People don't realize how hard it is for so few dollars. Yeah. So many shows are not paid, and if you do get paid, it's a small amount of yeah. money, and they just work because they believe in what they do. Yeah. They want to make people laugh. Crazy and they business. do. Yes. Crazy business. Achieving uh, happiness. It's, it ties back to the book. Everything ties back I'll to the book. I'll say it again. It's Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind, a spiritual, a spiritual and humorous approach to achieving happiness by Dr. Jeffrey L. Gurian. What's the L stand for? Lee. Lee. Jeffrey Lee. Jeffrey yeah. Lee. That's excellent. Well, everybody go and get this book. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, follow us online at, at Weekly Humorist and uh, sign up for our e- e-newsletters at weeklyhumorist.com. The next guaranteed delivery show is this Tuesday, April 2nd. And if you miss it, it's every first Tuesday of the month so you uh, can come by again and see us. All right. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, I'm Marty Dunnix. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Jeffrey. That was wonderful. That was awesome. Yeah.